it's important to look at the long-term implications of this virus in the hopes that we will learn from it because this country forgot that we all have a commitment to each other. We left too many people to be vulnerable and to be on their own during this terrible pandemic. Hi everyone, and welcome back to COVID-19 Heroes. I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider, and today I'm joined by Professor Fernando Torres Gill, a professor of social welfare and public policy at UCLA, an adjunct professor of gerontology at USC, and the director of the UCLA Center for Policy Research on Aging. As we all know, medically speaking, COVID has impacted the older generation the most. So today, we speak about the generational impacts of COVID at present and in the future. Hi, Professor Torres Gill. Thank you for being on today's show of COVID-19 Heroes. Welcome. Yes, it's a pleasure to be with you, and thank you for uh, the stories you're bringing out during this uh, difficult time. So you have dedicated your life's work to studying, researching, and teaching on aging. Give us a snapshot of where the U.S. population currently lies on its views towards age and ageism. It's uh, a pleasure to uh, share my stories from my vantage point as a gerontologist interested in issues of aging gerontology and geriatrics. And uh, I'll give you the short version of what is an entire quarter or semester's worth. But uh, very simply, in terms of uh, aging, it's important to note that uh, this the U.S. population, like much of the world, is getting older, living longer. And a larger proportion of the population is 65 years of age and over. And in particular, the aging of the baby boomer cohort, those of us born post-World War II, by 2029, there'll be roughly 80 million of us, 65 years of age and over. And in the past, we've made great progress in terms of uh, important public programs like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, the Old Americans Act. And we've made, I think, good progress in addressing issues of ageism. But this pandemic, sadly, is demonstrating that uh, we have a long ways to go because we're seeing both ageism and ableism cropping up. And uh, much of it has to do with the greater impact on older persons and persons with disability, those that are in long-term care facilities, those that are isolated without sufficient resources, and sadly, the highest death rates and infections are among older persons. So we're finding that we have a long ways to go because there is ageism and ableism and other words, either discrimination or secondary priority to the needs of older adults and those that have some type of disability. So much to do in this area. Many have said that if COVID-19 had been a virus targeting younger generations more, society may have taken the pandemic more seriously. Do you think that's true? I don't think that's entirely true. First of all, the younger generations of cohorts, whether they're Gen X or Millennials or Gen Z, uh, they've proven to be a wonderful group of younger cohorts. And certainly uh, their entrepreneurship, technological sophistication, their willingness to volunteer to be in the military and fight our wars in different parts of the world. They're a wonderful, sharp, and caring generation. Um, But I just think that had it been younger persons, perhaps I, I would turn it around. I think that the older generation would have been assertive and attentive and responsive in either uh, raising their taxes to pay for their needed services. I just think that younger persons are so preoccupied with a lot of other issues. Their large education bills, trying to start alive, find a job, they have a lot on their mind. So no, I would not put this I would not put reverse ageism on younger people. I just think it's society as a whole tends to focus on youth and forgets that someday they will be older. 
Due to stay-at-home orders, we're seeing a rise in loneliness, which is already an issue that plagues a lot of senior citizens. What are some other issues that have been magnified due to COVID? Well, first of all, let me reinforce the issue of social isolation. And all research studies and the recent reports by the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, and I've been a member of that academy, have shown conclusively that loneliness and social isolation is detrimental to your emotional, physical, and cognitive health. So we know that. Of course, many people choose to be alone, which is different than loneliness. But social interaction is so important. And uh, and unfortunately, as we get older, if we do not have a good social support system, family, friends, neighbors, pets, uh, we're more likely to become isolated when we lose our independence, our mobility, our driver's license. And unless there are other ways to reach out, loneliness becomes a serious issue. Then the pandemic has re- reinforced, sadly, the uh, incidences of loneliness and social isolation because older adults obviously have to be more careful, can't just be going out. And um, people have to be more careful to go see them. We've, we've not been able to have our grandkids in our house, sadly, because they're, they're young, seven and under. They know there's a bad bug that could hurt our grandparents. So they know to stay away and we miss them. Fortunately, my wife and I are enjoying each other and we have a nice house. And so many others don't have that kind of social support network. So we need to rethink how we reach out to others when this virus hopefully finally goes away because going back to the aging of the baby boomers, they will have the largest number of individuals growing old alone. And a lot of that is for baby boomers who will be the senior citizen population for the next 20 years or so, have chosen to either never marry, not have children, or they're divorced, or they're widowed, or they choose to enjoy their solitude and their independence, which puts them at greater risk when things like this pandemic hit. So one way to address that, by the way, is what we're doing. Technology has been wonderful in many ways. And uh, we've been enjoying, my wife and I, we're constantly busy with Zoom parties, Zoom with the family, Zoom with the kids and the grandkids. And uh, thank goodness for this kind of technology. Can you imagine if this had hit 20 years ago before we had all this? Yeah, I wondered about that. Yeah. It would have been just on the phone and uh, that wouldn't have sufficed. So anyway, technology will help, but we do need to develop new systems where we check up on each other, where there's a way to uh, reach out to each other. Alexis, by the way, is another good thing. You know, that certainly helps those of us that are at home and have different kinds of uh, disabilities or cognitive limitations. So I think technology can be very helpful, but we need to once again create the concepts of reciprocity where individuals reach out to each other. You are a member of the Governor's Master Plan on Aging Stakeholder Advisory Committee. When did you join this committee and what has its role been during the COVID-19 pandemic so far? This uh, question brings out Everything we've already discussed about uh, a year and a half ago when Governor Newsom was elected, he already had a strong background in issues of aging, homelessness, social media. San Francisco has been a leader in addressing the needs of the vulnerable, including older adults. So he was well-versed in issues of aging. I was so impressed. And I like to say I was uh, not a supporter of Gavin Newsom when he ran for mayor. I was a strong supporter of our former L.A. mayor, Antonio Veragosa. But I am a new found fan of Gavin Newsom because he gets it. Anyway, and one of his priorities, recognizing that California will have the largest number of older adults in the country. It's going to be a diverse population. And he values the contributions of older person and wants him to stay in California and not move to 
Nevada or Arizona or Montana. Uh, he created this master plan to look ahead and prepare us for the aging of California and how to enhance a quality of life for older adults and respond to their particular needs and contributions. And so originally our plans were with this group to look ahead and address the many issues, whether infrastructure, transportation, housing, wellness, home and community-based long-term care. But that has been pushed aside for the moment with the pandemic. So our priorities are on these very issues we discussed, how to make our nursing homes safer, as well as our boarding care facilities, our assisted living facilities, how to ensure that there's an adequate workforce to provide home-based care for those that are socially isolated, how to address issues of ableism and uh, ageism. And we've been struggling with uh, initial proposals by the Department of Public Health. Should we get another surge that forces us to ration health care and ventilators? Their initial proposals was to ration it based on age and ability, meaning that younger, healthier persons would go to the head of the line and older disabled persons would go to the back of the line. And so we've been re-educating state officials, hey, that's not the way you do it. But in either event, our focus has been on the immediate urgency related to the pandemic and its inordinate impact on older adults. The next great issue we're gonna deal with is the pending economic recession where the state will have to deal with major cuts in public programs. The governor's initial proposals were to have big reductions in uh, funding for programs like the in-home supportive services programs, board and care facilities, dental coverage and the Medi-Cal program. And so we're uh, pushing back as a group responding to the governor to ensure that it's more equitable. So, yeah. So we're dealing with the immediate crises, but the master plan is relevant because the fact is, you know, at some point in a year or two, the virus will be conquered, but aging will continue. And California will continue to see a dramatic increase in older adults. So we expect to be fully involved with this master plan on aging, uh, certainly throughout the terms of Governor Newsom, but he's been a great leader in many ways. That's great to hear. You are also a board member of Justice and Aging, a legal advocacy group on behalf of vulnerable elders. Is your work there similar? Oh, absolutely. And uh, it's one of my all-time favorite groups. And uh, Justice and Aging is doing the Lord's work, but doing it through litigation, through the law, through lawsuits, meaning that uh, we're using the power of the courts to address these issues of ageism and ableism. Justice and aging has actually been front and center in responding to the issues I've just mentioned. And uh, a number of us who are with Justice and Aging are on the Stakeholder Advisory Committee for the Master Plan on Aging. And our organization has the savvy, the sophistication, the expertise on all these issues to provide the litigation and legal support and legal advocacy. So I'm proud to be a board member. I've been a board member of many national organizations, including AARP and the Council on Foundations and many other things. But uh, this is one that I'm honored to put a lot of time with because uh, they really are on the front line in terms of legal advocacy for, for, for vulnerable elders. It's a great group. What effects do you foresee COVID having on older generations over the long term? Ah, that's a great question. Well, let me, re let me now kind of make it more relevant to younger populations. What I'd like to do is reframe the question to what effect will this pandemic have on younger persons today who hope to grow old with the measure of healthy longevity and a quality of life and uh, a measure of retirement and health security. So if I can, and may I ask you, Lorraine, your age? I'm 25. Oh, 25. So for all of the listeners who are 25 years of age or under 60 years of age, 
it's important to look at the long-term implications of this virus in the hopes that we will learn from it and recreate a social contract where we no longer have what we had in this crisis, which was uh, social, economic, and health inequities that led to tremendous insecurity, needless numbers of people who were ill and died, because this country forgot that we all have a commitment to each other. Because we did not have universal health and long-term care, because we did not have a minimum income, because we did not have adequate compensation and security for essential workers on the first front line, not just healthcare professionals, but grocery workers, truck drivers, farm workers, because we forgot that all of us have a stake in a society that cares for each other, we left too many people to be vulnerable and to be on their own during this terrible pandemic. And uh, with luck, all younger cohorts have the opportunity to live to be 80, 90 years of age and to become centenarians. So one of the great longevity dividends of this century is that we can live to be 100 years of age. So for a 25-year-old, plan on 75 more years. So therefore, the ableism and, and ageism we see today will haunt you unless you help recreate a social contract that brings back honest, transparent, sane government leadership and the public benefits and the willingness to pay the taxes to ensure that we have what Germany has, Canada has, South Korea has, Taiwan has, and those countries have done an amazing job minimizing the impact of this pandemic and ensuring that no one is left on their own. This country has done a terrible job and uh, we're all responsible so for the younger cohort, I hope we will learn from this pandemic and recreate a social contract. Do you think that COVID is likely to increase our bias toward ageism? I hope not, and it should not. And that's why groups like Justice and Aging are pushing an intergenerational agenda. So it should not, it cannot, I hope not, and I'll certainly work to mitigate any potential ageism. But again, the important thing is to remind young people who by just naturally feel they're invincible, you know, we call them, yeah, the invincibles, that um, all young pop groups like yourself will want to grow older, as I mentioned earlier, and not have to face ageism. And I might end this way, us baby boomers, by the way, are guilty because we were ageist when we were young. And in our famous music of the 1960s and 70s, one uh, famous song by the, uh, gosh, I forget, it wasn't, I forget the group. Uh, one of our famous uh, statements was, I hope I die before I get old. <laughs> and another was, don't trust anyone over 30. So, I tell my baby boomer cohorts that we were really ageist when we were in our teens and 20s and 30s. And we reveled in our youth and in our sex, drug, and rock and roll of the 60s and 70s and never thought we would uh, get old. We were sometimes referred to as the Peter Pan generation because we thought we would be young forever. So us old folks were guilty of being ages when we were younger. So for younger cohorts, please forgive us and don't treat us the way we treated our elders. So let me leave it at that. The, the irony of it all. <laughs> well, I definitely look forward to a prospective 75 more years of my life. That's very good news to me. <laughs> yes, well, thank you. And I have to now get ready for my class where I'm teaching Gen Z and, uh, and millennials. Well, Professor Torres Gill, thank you so very much for, for your time. It's I'm, I'm very grateful to have you and other peers like yourself be there leading the front to ensure that all generations live a long, prosperous life. Thank you. And you have a good rest of the day and keep up the good work, Lorraine. <laughs>
Take care. I'd like to close off this episode by thanking Professor Torres Gill and his peers on the different advocacy and legal boards who work to eliminate ageism and ableism. Like he said, no one escapes old age and we all have the power to ensure that each generation supports the one that came before us and the one that will come after us. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, I'd be grateful if you shared it with a friend or even left a rating or review. Stay well, stay healthy. Until next time, I'm your host, Lorraine Schneider. Thank you.